Thank you, respected chairpersons. And before I go ahead, you're all welcome for the RSSDI 2022 in Chennai between October 6th and 9th. And this is a very significant year in the history of RSSDI. And this is a golden jubilee year, actually. So you're welcome. We are there to help, to take care of you. Please come. We'll be there. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Banshi. Thank you, the um, uh, chairpersons. <coughs> so uh, after hearing two lectures, which are very molecule-based, I'm going to come to down to earth. And what is it we have learned in the last 25 years with uh, landmark trials that we can think about? Now, uh, we know that uh, you know, about 30 years ago, when uh, Hafner has said that mere presence of diabetes is equal to cardiovascular risk equivalent. Mere presence of diabetes. Either if you have cardiovascular disease without diabetes or diabetes without uh, cardiovascular disease, the mortality is going to be the same. That's number one. Suppose if you have both together and the problem is going to be multiplied. So this is how it said that and then, then we started looking into what is going to happen actually. So if you look into the various studies that we had so far, and more to this, actually, more to this were going to be there. How about uh, benefit of glucose control in reducing macrovascular complications is a big question that we've been asking again and again. Now, the first thing which comes to our mind is UKPDS. We know that it's about median follow-up of 10 years, and the whole study is extended up to 20 years till the end of it. But the median follow-up is going to be 10 years. If you look into the primary endpoint, is there any improvement in diabetes-related death? Is there a reduction in non-fatal myocardial infarction, heart failure and angina, non-fatal stroke, and so on, including microvascular complications as well. Now, if you look into that, in those days in UKPDS, it was only monotherapy. Only 240 patients out of 10,000 patients have been in a combination of sulfur and metformin. Everything is only monotherapy. We didn't have the drugs like DPP-4, pagliterazone, and then we didn't have SGLT inhibitors at that time. Either they are on metformin, or they're on sulfonylurea or on insulin. That's all monotherapy. And the effectiveness, if you see that at the end of 15 years, you could see that the difference between the conventional and intensive group is only 0.9%. It's, it sounds very, uh, um, very disappointing. But look at this. Just 0.9%, about 1% of HbA1c reduction was able to reduce the re diabetes-related deaths by 21%. The microvascular, microvascular complications by 37%, heart attacks by 14%, and amputations by 43%, and stroke is 12%. So the only stroke did not uh, get into statistical significance, but all the others you can see that just 0.9% reduction HbA1c has got so much of benefits, both micro and microvascular complications. Now, it is also told us, it is such we have learned through this UKPDS that the beta cell function at the time of diabetes detection is about 50% beta cell is lost. This is what he learned. And then it is also told that there is no point in having monotherapy because every monotherapy that has been there over the years is going to fail. It's about nine years. And that is the reason if you see that in UKPDS 53, it said that at the end of seven, eight, nine years, about 68% of the people required insulin for control of diabetes. So monotherapy has got no uh, um, I mean, and we'll come back to that why we should change from monotherapy to combination therapy. Now, the most important thing is before UKPDS, we didn't have any targets to say. Okay, you give the target this much and then you'll have a good results. Instead, what we had in those days is that symptom relief and quality of life improvement. That's the only thing that we had. But this is the first study which said that you have to have a target. Like, you know, bring down the HbA1c less than 7. Bring down the fasting blood sugar 110. Postprandial to 160. Then you'll get the benefit. So this is what any reduction in HbA1c is beneficial. That's what it said. This is what we learned. And then we started about 20 years ago the targeted therapy. The targets for control so that we get the benefits. This is the first study. Now, it didn't stop there. After that, after the study is over, they followed it for the next 12 years. And then they found that and these are all UKPDs are all newly detected diabetes and followed up. So what has happened is that during the follow-up, those who had 1% extra reduction of HbA1c, they did well, even the study is over, when both the HbA1c, both the groups are the same. 
they did improve in the sense that there is a reduction in cardiovascular disease, there is a reduction in microvascular complications as well. And this is what is called as metabolic memory, which is nothing but intracellular hyperglycemia induces overproduction of the you know, uh, superoxide and uh, reactive oxygen species at the mitochondrial level as a possible cause of metabolic memory of hyperglycemia stress after glucose number. So the, the learn, what we learned from this UKPD is that we should not wait for glycemic control. We should do it immediately so that the metabolic memory changes. Even for the first 10 years, if it's a good control, or if even five years of good control, this is going to have a lasting effect in the next 10, 15 years in reduction of complications in spite of maybe not under good, very good control. So this is what is called as metabolic memory. The first five to 10 years is a very, very important aspect. That's what UKPDS we have learned. But then came the DCCT trial. You know, this is basically in type 1 diabetics. And then there about, it's a small study, about 1,400 type 1 diabetes are taken, and then 700 in each one. And then mean follow-up was a 6.5 years. And what has happened was that between the difference is that we could see that in DCCT, in type 1 diabetics, the glycemic control has a benefit. That is 76% reduction in retinopathy, microalbuminuria by 34%, neuropathy by 6 percent this seems to be extraordinary compared to what we have seen in uh, UKPDS. This is more than what we have seen in UKPDS. I'll come back to that. Why? What is it we can do further beyond UKPDS to get the same sort of results? Now, EDIC trial is 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 uh, what has happened was after that uh, uh, 6.5 years of follow-up. Then, when they ended the study, and you can see that next seven years or so, they are both the groups at the same HbA1c. Now. Look at the results. A long-term good control of diabetes, first control of diabetes, in later on in the study, there was able to that 42% risk reduction in coronary artery disease. This is what is called as EDIC trial, extension of uh, DCCT trial. So we can see that uh, the, the whole concept after these things and look into that VADT trial and et cetera, it said that what is glycemic legacy has been learned from us, legacy. You can see that if you don't control diabetes in the beginning, what happens is that if you, if you do it late, like what we have seen in VADT trial, what happens is that we may not get benefit later on after 10 years of diabetes. If you try to control tightly, you may not get the same benefits that you can get when, when, the, when you control the diabetes in the beginning itself. And this is what is called the legacy, glycemic legacy. Now, Clearly, these two studies have really l we, is, uh, told us, or we have learned from these two studies, extraordinary studies, how to treat diabetes is the most important. You know, later on we have studies which said how not to treat diabetes as well. So EDIC and the DCCT, EDIC and UKPDS follow-up studies underscore the fact that good control of diabetes achieved early in the natural history of diabetes has a long-lasting effect with my metabolic memory and legacy effect in reduction of complications. So friends, do it as soon as possible. Now, this is my favorite, actually, study. We remember that we, there is a difference between UKPDS and, uh, and DCCT trial. If you come to STENO2 trial, this is an extraordinary trial. What happens is very simple. It is nothing but multifactorial management. It's not just glycemic control. You address the lipids, you address the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, hypertension. A, 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 a holistic approach to type 2 diabetics is taken into great stretch, and you can see that four years follow-up, in fact, you can see that there is a reduction in nephropathy by 63%, extraordinary, even beyond uh, DCCT, retinopathy by 55%, and the neuropathy, autonomic neuropathy by 70%, almost. This is at the end of four years. In fact, they have to stop this study because the, the conventional group are devoid of these advantages, including cardiovascular disease reduction. So they have to stop this study because it becomes an ethical issue. You are denying the people who are in the conventional group the benefits that you got in the tight control group. And that's the reason they had to stop it, and everybody has put on to multifactorial management. Look at what has happened about eight years follow-up. You can see that there is a 53% risk reduction in cardiovascular endpoints. This is phenomenal. And then you can see that the same effect on microvascular complications continued. At 13 years, you can see that <clears throat> there is 57 percent, there's further improvement on 57 percent reduction, and there is 46 percent reduction in mortality. This is again extraordinary with that. 
At 20 years follow-up after steno trial, you can see that clinical benefits of a legacy effect that we have seen with both the DCCT and UKPDS. The intensive multifactorial treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes and microalbuminuria, that it has increased, there is an increase, the gain of 7.8 years of life, according to the calculation. So that means it's not just glycemic control. Along with that, glycemic control has benefits. If you can control also, the, the word, what we learned from Esteno 2 is that apart from glycemic control, which has got benefits, if you can control also the other comorbidities that are associated, majority of the people have got type 2 diabetes, got hypertension and dyslipidemia. If you can do that, the benefits are going to be, now uh, 1 plus 1 is not 2, rather 4. That's what it has said. Now then came, about 15 years ago, a landmark trials in the form of ACCORD, advanced and VADT trials. These are the three trials have shown, so far you can see that the UKPDS, DCCT, and as well as the STENO2 trials have shown how to treat diabetes. But whereas these trials, these three trials, which has come again, landmark trials, they, the results look very negative. But it's also said that how we should not treat diabetes is the main thing that we learned from these three trials. Now look at the ACCORD trial. These are all about average duration of first 10 years. And the inclusion criteria itself has got high risk population. And then the study is supposed to be for 3.5 years, and but they have to end this study at the end of two years and three months. I'll tell you the reason. And also the 35% of these subjects had already macrovascular disease. And then they said by hook or crook, within six months you need to bring down the blood glucose level or HbA1c level less than seven. We don't know what is it. And 65% of the population in a trial had rosiglitazone. We see that. The primary endpoint, if you see that, uh, you see that the, uh, the uh, non-fatal MI, if you can see that, non-fatal MI, there is a good reduction. This is a primary endpoint, 186 or 235. But whereas you look at the CVD death, which is increased by 135 versus 94, and this prompted that they have to stop the study, okay? So now it showed why, how not to treat diabetes as well. So this trial stopped. The, the mortality is higher in patients with severe hypoglycemia because when they were so in a great hurry to bring down the blood glucose, in, in a 10-year diabetic patient, long-lasting diabetes, we had hb one more than 8.5, and suddenly you try to bring down the HbA1c, there is increased mortality, mainly because of hypoglycemia. The autopsy has not been done in these people. It is suspected to be myocardial infarction, but it could be hypoglycemia. Most often, about half the people are supposed to be due to hypoglycemia. So it's suggested that we have to have an individualized treatment is suggested. Less aggressive lowering of HB in, in, in high risk population. Patients in the intensive group who did not have history of CVD and those baseline HB was less than eight had a significantly low events, indicating that short duration of diabetes and healthy people, we can be aggressive. Rest of the people, we should not be aggressive. So there are so many, you know, that uh, the sub-analysis of uh, ACCORD trial, which is a negative trial. I always, though people say that negative trial, I take it a positivity that how not to treat diabetes. We can see that there's a physiological hypothesis, behavioral hypothesis, and health system hypothesis in this. The hypoglycemia preconditioning is very, very important. Instead of having a sudden severe hypoglycemia, even if people have some, you know, you, you, you got that ischemic precondition, we talk about that. There is something they have evolved stating that it's a hypoglycemia precondition. Mild hypoglycemia, which is not dangerous, could be beneficial. That is number one. And behavioral hypothesis include that, so those people who did not quickly come down HbA1c, have a look at those people and don't treat too aggressively, try to bring down a bit slowly. Otherwise, they'll get into severe hypoglycemia and that can be detrimental for the life as well. And then, all this is also said that health system hypothesis, he said that algorithm basic uh, tactics increase the risk in high risk population and then you need to have a individualized tailor-made goals for these people. So these are the things it taught us. If you look into the sub-analysis of what has happened there. So this is an important in the sense that though it's a negative trial, they had to stop the trial, we learned something from there. Advanced trial, again, it's a, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's again a, uh, uh, the trial has been uh, 
suggested or done in people who got a long-standing diabetes, who got a cardiovascular disease, and then you know, they were able to uh, uh, try, try to treat diabetes in this population. You should do it minimum about, again, here also you can see the 32% of parietal microvascular event. Now, what has happened was that there is not much of a result. It is only that intensive glycemic control that is combined primary outcome, that is both micro and macro together. There is no difference at all. There is no statistical difference at all between the intervention group. What has been found in this particular thing is that the usefulness of sulfonylureas did not increase the mortality before even the Carolina trial has come. So this has told like this, and then there is, there is no harm in continuing sulfonylureas. That's one thing that has shown. But again, you can see that the VADT trial, again, this is very old people with all complications together. You can see that 40% had prior CVD, 80% had hypertension, 50% dyslipidemia, and you know, baseline h was 9.4, and then they followed for 7.5 years and got the results. So look at this. There's a good improvement, but not to a significance. So you can see that all these three trials seems to be looking negative, but what you need to understand is that these are all having all the macrovascular complications, a long-standing diabetes, and baseline h is very, very high, and there's no point in doing it. This, these results do not apply to patients with less advanced disease, younger patients, and early aggressive treated patients. It doesn't happen. That's what you see in UK PDS and Steno2. That's a different issue. For intensive uh, glucose control to yield significant CVD reduction, you may have to do it early. If you go into population that already had multiple risk factors, cannot expect benefits from glucose control in the short term. This is what is, we have learned from these studies. Now, then came the molecular base. These are all, you know, the studies with glycemic control. Then came a very important molecules that we have in the last 10 years or so, uh, in last five, six years or so. We have a fantastic, you know, which changed the, you know, the way we need to treat them. What we say that it, uh, 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 it has given us a lot of opportunities to have a better control. One is DPP for inhibitors. About 15 years ago, we had. It has changed the way we thought about the disease. Now, we go to the empiric outcome. You can see that all of you know about that. <clears throat> it reduced the CV death by 43% and mortality by 38%, and you know, and so on and so on. Heart failure, basically, heart failure, hospitalization is reduced to a great extent. So, we can see that then. They, apart from that, they, we have credence trial, which we got it, and we went, uh, in a DAPA kidney we got, and MPA renal is to be out shortly. This has showed that the benefit on renal aspect as well. Two minutes, two minutes. So that it will increase the, uh, uh, it, it will increase the, yeah. And then these are, the, 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 what are the benefits you got in these trials? It looks like seem to be the class effect. All the SGLT inhibitors will have the same benefit for all the benefits that we have. Then we had a lot of GLP-1 receptor agonists, which also showed CB benefits. Now, if you see that, if you look into that, you know, the philosophy of treatment is changed now. That is that there's no point in, remember what has found in UK PDS, it's a monotherapy. Now we have to come to a state that the philosophy of treatment is don't address hyperglycemia, rather address the pathophysiological factors that cause hypoglycemia. And then the benefits, it should be there in that place that redu reduce hypoglycemia, reduce weight gain also should be there. For that, we have to be proactive, not reactive therapy. Go for a combination therapy from the beginning itself. That's the main thing that we can think about. Now, to suggest this or to confirm this, what we have learned from Verify study, especially Indian population, is that we can see that if you have an early combination of uh, early combination of therapy, there is 53% risk reduction in time to initial failure versus monotherapy. And then if you can see that, um, uh, you know, when you have a monotherapy, it is about, they fail at 1.5 years. And when you have a combination therapy with DPP4 in the beginning, the failure is going to be at 4.75 years. This is something extraordinary, three times. This is much better than in Indian population compared to the whole population of 200 patients, 2,000 patients all over the world. So if you can see that, the need for third agent when you're in a combination therapy is reduced by 58%. So it indicates that we need to address more and more pathophysiological factors. That's what it says, actually. Coronary trial basically done for to, uh, to know the efficacy and safety of linagliptin. But what you have found is that this has been taken 
over by the sulfonylureas, uh, the linagliptin. So linagliptin has been carmelin at trial. It has been found to be cardiovascular safe. So they compared again with sulfonylurea, they found equally good results. There's no, well, no one is non-inferior trial actually, non-inferior has been found. So sulfonylureas can be a very good agent, which are very, especially glimipiride, in this study is only glimipiride. It said that it's a safe coronary reactive cell. So friends, if you look into that, what is it we have learned from these studies is that most of the landmark trials have made us understand that this is better. Change philosophy of management is explained and taught how to treat and also how not to treat activities. Thank you for your patience.